Well, once again, God bless you all for coming out tonight. This is a very, very cold evening. Just excited, though, about what the Lord's going to have for us. If you will open your Bibles to the book of Exodus, chapter 4, second book of the Bible, Exodus, chapter 4. We're going to read about God who calls a reluctant Moses. God calls a reluctant Moses. Last time we read about God calling Moses to lead Israel out of Egypt. As you remember in chapter 3, the first step in that call was unto holiness. If you look back at Exodus 3 verse 5, he, the Lord said, saying to Moses, do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet for the place where you stand is holy ground. And so the Lord wanted Moses to realize that Drawing near to God is all about holiness. Be holy, therefore, for the Lord your God is holy. And so we're to obviously put away sin and the, and the carnal things of this life that so easily trip us up, and we're to walk before him in a holy manner. That's the first step in the call of serving God. The second step was to put a burden for God's people in Moses' heart. Look at verse 7. The Lord said, he's saying this again to Moses, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And so God knew the sorrows of the Israelites there in slavery in Egypt. For 400 years they had served cruel taskmasters. And they cried out to God for 400 years, crying out to the Lord for the deliverer that he promised. And now God was beginning to move, but he wanted the deliverer who was, you know, 100, 200 miles away in Midian. Remember how Moses, when he was 40 years old, he decided at that point, well, I'm going to show that I am the deliverer. And so he killed an Egyptian and hid his body in the sand. And, of course, it's a bad place to hide bodies because when the wind blows, sand exposes arms and stuff that stick out there. And, and so the next day, Moses saw a couple of Hebrew men fighting. And he said, you know, this is wrong. Your brethren, why are you doing this? And the, the wrongdoer said, what are you going to do? Kill me like you did the Egyptian yesterday? And word got out that Moses had indeed killed that Egyptian taskmaster. And Moses' adopting father-in-law, who was, or, or excuse me, adopting grandfather. Who was Moses' adopting grandfather? What position did that grandfather have? Anybody remember? He was the pharaoh of Egypt. Remember how Moses was adopted by Pharaoh's daughter as she was out bathing on the Nile River, uh, sending her handmaids out before her first. Why? Because of crocodiles that are there. Yeah, that's right. She's no dummy. She's the daughter. She's a princess. You know, put, put the servant girls out there first, and when the crocodiles have their lunch, then she can go bathe. So they got Moses out of the, out of the water, and then she raised him. And then when Moses was 40 years old, he said, you know what? I know I'm Jewish. I know I'm a Hebrew, and I'm going to go be with my people. And so he rejected Egypt, much to the dismay of his grandfather, who really was grooming Moses to possibly become the next Pharaoh. And so when he was 40 years old, he killed the Egyptian. Then once word got out, his grandfather was really mad. Not only had he rejected the family and rejected the nation of Egypt, but now he had killed an Egyptian. And so grandfather wanted Moses put to death, and Moses fled. For the next 40 years, he was earning his BSD degree. You know what the BSD degree is? Backside of the desert degree. And so there he was for 40 years following sheep. His father-in-law, sheep, he met a girl, you know, Zipporah was her name. And she liked him, he liked her. And, uh, and so the dad said, hey, let's make a deal. And so they made a deal. And Moses was content just to live there and to watch his father-in-law's sheep. His father-in-law, his name, by the way, went by two names. What were they? Who remembers? Jethro and, begins with R, Ruel. That's right, Jethro and Ruel. Same guy, two names. Uh, so uh, content to live there, but now 40 years later, Moses is 80 years old. That's when the burning bush thing happens there in chapter 3. And uh, Moses was just content, happy as a clam to lead a very simple life. He had maybe lost that burden for the suffering of, of God's people Israel. And so God reunited Moses with that burden, put that burden back in his heart. Well, God had this call on him, called him to holiness, called him to be burdened for the people, called him to go back. But the problem, though, with God's callings is in order for them to be fulfilled, 
the called needs to cooperate. If God is calling you, in order for the calling of God in your life to be fulfilled, you, I, must be willing to cooperate. And initially, Moses wasn't willing. Look at verse 11. Moses said to God, well, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? This is chapter 3 still. Still background here. Forgive me for such a long background. Uh, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? Who am I? Well, then God began one by one to remove Moses' excuses. So verse 12, he, the Lord, said, I will certainly be with you. And really, that's all you need to know. I'm a nobody. Who am I? I don't have a, a seminary degree. I don't have higher training. I certainly don't know how to speak good, you know. Who am I? You know, I'm just some, some goofy kid from California that got lost in the freeway, and 20 years ago, here we are, you know. And uh, wrecking two trucks on the way, two pickup trucks on the way. Some of you know the story, many of you don't. We'll tell it to you someday. Maybe tonight, I don't know, we'll see. But, uh, you know, what are we doing? We're not qualified. Um, Nobody is for that matter. And those who think they're qualified are disqualified by the very fact that they think that they're qualified. Because God can't use them. No, they're bringing too much of them to the table. How much of us does God want us to bring? Nothing. So that the sufficiency will be of him. I will certainly be with you. That's your answer. Well, Moses then brought up another excuse. Verse 13, Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel, say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they say, Well, what is his name? What shall I say to them? We don't even know your name. God removed that excuse as well. Verse 14, the Lord said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. But then at that point, instead of Moses coming up with an excuse, God then told Moses that there would be a major obstacle. And it was Pharaoh who would refuse to let Israel go. But by doing so, Pharaoh would pit himself against God, which, by the way, is always a losing proposition. Notice in verse 19, Uh, you know, Moses is told by God, when you go back, Pharaoh won't let you go. I'm sure the king of Egypt will not let you go, not even by a mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in its midst. After that, he will let you go. And that brings us now to chapter four, where God and Moses continue their conversation. God tells Moses what to do. Moses tells God why he can't. God then tells Moses why he can. Moses tells God why he can't. Ultimately, God wins, and Moses reluctantly gets in line. Now, there are usually two types of people. Everybody, by the way, has a call of God on them. Everybody. Every believer in Jesus Christ, there is a call on your life to some place of service and ministry. If you don't know what it is, all you need to do Start praying more. Ask God to reveal it to you. It may be a simple step you take in a direction, and you may not know where that will lead. But every believer has a call on their life. Sometimes God reveals what that call might be. At that point, believers can react in one of two ways. There are those who would say, cool, let's go for it. And then there are others who would say, oh, no, 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 you got the wrong person. No, no, no. I'm sorry you dialed the wrong number. My last digit is nine, not seven, you know. And there are people that resist the call of God out of fear. You know, how many of you would be comfortable to get up in in, in front of people and speak to them? I'm sure some of you would say, oh, that's no big deal. What's the big deal? You're getting up, you're reading the Bible, and you're just explaining it. That's why, why wouldn't anybody be able to do that? As somebody else would say, I'd rather be dead than to try to stand up in front of people and teach the Bible. And what, get up in front of the fifth graders? There ain't no way, you know, and some of that can't be God's call for my life. And so, who are you? Are you one who would say, hey, Lord, wherever you want, here we go. I'm excited about it. Or are you like Moses, reluctant? If you're reluctant, you're in a good place. Um... But let us all remember, let us all remember that we have got to remember the sufficiency of, is of God. It has nothing to do with us, our talents, our abilities, or perceived advantages or anything. Because it's God who brings the increase, not man.
not man. So if you, if, if you feel like Moses, then you are in good company. If you're nervous about what the Lord may put on your life, you're in good company. But remember, it's God, not us. We read in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves. I mean, this is Paul, by the way, who was very learned, very well-trained, excellent speaker, excellent communicator, gifted author, and even says, but our sufficiency is from God. So God wants to be the power to cause good things to happen. In fact, in verses 1 through 9, we read about the evidences of anointing. Moses is nervous about, you know, proving that God has really called him. Why would you send me to people and not give me evidence as proofs? And so the Lord starts to give him some calling cards. You know, a police officer has what that shows his authority? Has a badge and, and a gun, you know. Yeah, I want to see my authority. Here's the real authority and this badge too, you know. Uh, people have their credentials. What gives you the right? I have these credentials, blah, blah, blah. Well, when God calls a person, they don't need a badge. They, they certainly don't need a gun. What they need is God's anointing. Verse 1, then Moses answered and said, but suppose, again, he's, he's excuses, and, and what if? <laughs> Anybody here ever play the what if game? Yeah, you're in good company. You're just as sick and twisted as Moses was here. <laughs> But what if, suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say, well, the Lord has not appeared to you. And by the way, such was not the case. The elders never questioned that. In fact, they were just all too glad. When Moses came back, they were like, oh, you're the guy. They never doubted him, at least not initially. Oh, later on when they were in the wilderness, they were ready to kill him. But at this point, when he first came to them, they were on board. Moses' fears of what if were unfounded, just like ours. We tend to worry about what ifs, but do they ever happen? Those what ifs, what if they do this and she does that and this happens and then the banks and, and the government and what if and, and we play that game and we worry ourselves sick and those things don't happen and we've wasted a lot of heart time. And our hearts are so important. We've got to guard our hearts, and the Bible says to guard our hearts in Christ Jesus. Jesus isn't worried. He's not playing the what-if game. And when we do that, our hearts are not in Him. They're in our perceived, imagined fears. And we are wasting precious, valuable heart time that should be resting firmly in Jesus Christ where there is peace. You know, in Jesus, you know that, that you're in Jesus when you say, well, even if the what-ifs happen, so what? The Lord has my life. I don't care. You know, my life's in his hands. He's got it in control. It doesn't matter what happens. None, as Paul said, none of these things move me. The tribulations, the trials, the, the people stabbing him in the back, and, the, and all the, the, the trials and tribulations and the sicknesses that he went through. He says, none of those things move me. I don't even count my life dear to myself. But he fixed his eyes on Jesus. His heart was in the right place. He wasn't wasting heart time. May God help us not to waste heart time. So what if they say the Lord has a what if? They say, well, God didn't appear to you. The Lord said to him, what's in your hand? This is a rod. It's a stick about six foot tall used to drive away wolves and other predators from the sheep. And when a sheep gets out of line and you need to reach out and touch them, you know, that's what the rod was for. He said, well, it's a rod. And he said, well, cast it to the ground. So he cast the ground, and it became a serpent, and Moses fled from it. Now it's a six-foot-long snake. It's scary stuff. You know, there's some people that are snake people. I don't mind snakes too much. There's, there's some, though, that are, like, obsessed with them. And then there are some who don't even want to live on the same planet with them. And those are most of the people. And Moses apparently was one of these guys. who cast it. It's a snake. Ah, oh, you know, he jumped back. Became a serpent. Then the Lord said to Moses, and I love this part, now reach out your hand and take it by the tail. Say what? You want me to tell? No, no. But he does. He musters up the faith. You know, if God tells you to do something that you think is dangerous, first of all, make sure it's God. But if it is the Lord, then do it. 
because it's the safest thing to do. And he caught it, and it became a rod in his hand. Wow, that's a wow factor right there. So what if they don't believe me? We'll take that rod, throw it down, and it'll be a snake. Then you grab it by the tail, it'll become a rod again. Wow, that's the wow factor that those, those leaders need to see. You know what, though? It would have been very, extremely significant to the Egyptians, more so than just the leaders of Israel. More than just a wow factor, this was an actual declaration of the true and living God that the gods of the Egypt were false and bogus and not to be trusted in. The Egyptians worshipped many, many gods, including Uraeus, depicted as a cobra ready to strike. Here's the, the burial mask of Tutankhamun from different angles. And you see that cobra there ready to strike. That's the god Uraeus, symbol worn by Pharaohs of, uh, to, to depict sovereignty, royalty, divine authority, and power in Egypt. And so by Moses picking up the serpent by the tail and it becoming a stick, God was declaring to Pharaoh that, hey, Pharaoh, you are powerless to do anything against my people Israel. You look to the snake as being so powerful and all, a powerful symbol. It's nothing because I turn snakes into sticks. So Moses did. He grabbed nervously, grabbed the snake by the tail, it became a stick again. And then God says, and by so doing, verse 5, that they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. So a miraculous sign, and there will be three miraculous signs that the Lord gives to Moses. By the way, God is still in the business of giving his people miraculous signs in order to prove that God is real. In the Gospel of Mark, we read in chapter 16, Jesus, after he'd risen from the dead, had, had been in John's Gospel speaking a lot about the baptism of the Spirit and all. And in Acts chapter 1, Jesus said, you'll receive power when the Spirit has come upon you, and you'll be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the earth. The baptism of the Spirit and then the subsequent gifts of the Holy Spirit are signs, powerful signs, to show believers and non-believers that God is real and he's alive today. Jesus said, these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. And we read about that in Acts chapter 2. They will take up serpents. Not on purpose, by the way. Because Jesus said, you know, don't put the Lord to a foolish test in those, those hillbilly churches that pass around rattlesnakes. And in fact, there is one hillbilly church in, uh, I think it's West Virginia. I don't know why West Virginia has them all, but they have several of them. Passing around rattlesnakes, you know, in their worship service. Uh, one pastor got bit and he died. His son then became the pastor of the church. And for a few years, things were okay until he got bit and died. You're playing with snakes, going to get bit. But if you, they will take up serpents. Now we read about the, the, what God really meant in the book of Acts. Remember when Paul was on a ship headed to Rome and it was shipwrecked and they ended up surviving on the island of Malta, swimming ashore? They were gathering sticks to make a fire. It was raining and cold, and Paul was gathering a bundle of sticks. And a serpent came out, latched a hold of Paul's arm, a poisonous snake. The people, the, 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 the islanders knew that it was a poisonous snake. And they said, oh, uh, you know, surely this man is a murderer because though he escaped the sea, yet the gods will not allow him to escape now. He's going to die. Well, Paul shook the snake off in the fire, and he never swelled up. He didn't convulse. He didn't pass out. He just kept gathering more sticks. And after a while, the people realized, hey, you know, he's not a bad guy. In fact, they even thought he was himself a god because he survived the snake bite. So here's what the Lord is saying. They will take up serpents. If you accidentally find yourself on the wrong end of a rattlesnake or something else, and you're in the service of God and God's not done with you yet, you're going to be fine. You will be fine. And if you accidentally uh, drink anything deadly, you know that it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. These are miraculous signs, sign gifts, 
that God gives to some of his people when they're baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, your gifts will be different from my gifts, which will be different from her gifts, which are different from his gifts. Nobody receives all of them. There's about 18 in all that I read about in the book of Romans, 1 Corinthians, and, and the book of Ephesians. But some people may receive more than one. And if you want to know more about the gifts, I can give you some scriptures to read later on. Uh, but the Lord does say that the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. And so if we are going to be a New Testament church, first of all, we need to all be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then we need to let the Lord reveal to us what those gifts are that he has for us. And then we need to start using them within this body. Every believer using his or her gift or gifts for the benefit of the body of Christ. I believe, and I've said it before, and I'll say it again, the biggest need that the Christian church in America has today is the real deal, honest to goodness, no kidding, baptism of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit manifested through the church to this lost and dying world. Look, we have come to a day when the average typical Christian church is more concerned with programs and performance than it is on the powerful move of the Holy Spirit. Pastors are being trained not necessarily what to say, but how to say it, how to move people emotionally, how to manipulate people into giving and buying in. And I talked with a young man who goes to a so-called Bible college, and he said it's really sad in our in, in our, uh, we, we have these mandatory, um, what are they called? Chapel services, mandatory chapel services. He goes, I don't hardly ever hear the name Jesus mentioned ever. And this is the next generation of church leaders. And you never hear the name of Jesus. Because it's all about programs and performance, setting the mood, really tickling, itching ears. No longer about the Word of God. No longer is it, wow, you know, we're going to wait on God and we're going to see the Spirit move. We're going to anticipate because God wants to move among His people. Man, I long for the days when, and I hate to sound like an old guy, but I remember back when I was in high school, you know. But I do remember there were times we would wait on the Lord and the, and the, and the Spirit would move. Some people would speak in tongues. There would be an interpretation. There would be prophecy. There would be word of knowledge, word of wisdom. We saw healings. I knew we had a youth retreat one time. I was a youth pastor at the time. And, and uh, one, we were in a prayer time, and this girl says, you know, I think God wants to heal somebody. All of a sudden, there was this man who was an adult counselor. I, I keep in, in, a little bit in contact with him every now and then. He said... I felt this sensation run up to my ear that was deaf. I, I had permanent hearing damage in my left ear. I heard a pop, and then I could hear, just as she prayed that prayer. And so I've been there when healing has occurred. In our church, several years ago, there was a lady who was diagnosed with cancer. She called for the elders of the church. We anointed her with oil. We prayed, lay hands on her, prayed for her, just as the scripture said. She went back to her oncologist, and he said, you don't have any cancer anymore. What happened? We've seen healing happen. And God wants to move if his people want him to. If his people want him to. I hope we want to, because these are signs that God gives to us to prove that he's real. You can't fake the moving of the Spirit. Oh, you can try, but people see through it. But when the Spirit's moving, there's no denying. You know, even tongues. We read, therefore, tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. Tongues can, you know, in a prayer service, when it's used properly, it makes the non-believers go, whoa, what was that? And they explain what's happening. Prophesying is not for unbelievers, but for those who believe. So prophecy, speaking forth God's word, is for us. And the other gifts are for either believers or non-believers or for both, but they are signs. Just like Moses and the stick into a snake and back into a stick again. 
Even so, God gives gifts of the Spirit for us to prove to the world that Jesus is real. Another thing that Moses was able to do, look at verse 6, the supernatural move of God. Furthermore, the Lord said to him, now put your hand in your bosom. He had a robe, and so he stuck his, kind of the, the Napoleon thing, and stuck his hand in his, his coat, robe. He said, now pull it out again. And uh, when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. And back then, especially, leprosy was a death sentence. Today, if you catch it, you can arrest the development of it, but you can't replace the fingers and toes and the nose and the ears that are lost. You can't reverse it. But back then, there was no reversing. There's no stopping it. You died. And then so he's looking at his, oh, I got leprosy. And he said, now put your hand in your bosom again. So he put his hand in his bosom again, drew it out of his bosom. Behold, it was restored like his other flesh. Wow, that's cool. <laughs> first the gross-out factor, then the, hey, I'm okay factor. Then it will be, if they do not believe you nor heed the message of the first sign, they may believe the message of the latter sign. And it shall be, if they do not believe either of these two signs or listen to your voice, that you shall take water from the river. That would be which river in Egypt there? The Nile River, which they worshipped, which they believed was the source of all life. Take water from the source, their, their life source, and then what you, water, what you take from the river will become like blood on dry land. So again, that's a declaration that their gods that they worship are death. See, the stick to snake, God declared that God is the king of kings, not Pharaoh with the funny snake on his head. The leprosy becoming whole, God declared that God is a great physician. And the Nile becoming blood, God declared that he is all-powerful and the one and only source of life, not that river. Verses 10 through 17, no more excuses, you're going. How many of you kids like to hear that from your parents? You're going, get in the car, no whining about it. That's what basically God is saying to, to Moses. And he's 80 years old. Then Moses said to the Lord, look at these other excuses, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. Man, that wasn't even true because only eloquent people use the word eloquent. <laughs> I am not eloquent, neither hath I been able to speaketh very well, you know, or whatever. He just probably even add an English accent to sound even more sophisticated, you know. And also is a lie because the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts through Stephen said, and Moses, oh, wait, where is it? Is it? No. Oh, I didn't even put it up there. Sorry. Oh, well. This is what, if I had it up there, it was Acts chapter 7, verse 22. Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. He was a very gifted orator, public speaker, but here he's saying, I can't speak anymore. And by the way, even if he were handicapped, God overcomes all handicaps. He more than makes up for what we lack. So the Lord said to him, who made man's mouth? And by the way, you're telling me something? You're informing me of something you think I don't know? That's problematic, isn't it? You know, sometimes when people pray, it's, it's uh, Lord, I pray for my aunt. You know that aunt, the one who lives in, you know, in, in, in Middleton, Tennessee. You know that aunt, you know, Sandy. Not, not Carol, but, but Sandy, you know. And, you know, she has the two kids. You know God, Patrick and Shauna. And, you know, Shauna, you know, she's older than Patrick, but, you know, uh, Sandy has them. And, and, you know, she's the one who moved to, and God's like, oh, I didn't know. Of course he knows, you know. He knows. Of course he does. And so Moses is here thinking he's informing God of something that God might not know. Lord, did you take into consideration I don't speak well? <laughs> what? Who made man's mouth? Who makes the mute, the deaf, the seeing, or the blind? Have not I, the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall say. I pray that God would help us to quit considering our limitations. Quit re and, and for, you know, that we would also, if we feel that way, quit relying upon our own gifts and abilities, but instead 
go where God wants us to go, say what God wants us to say, trusting that the real change is going to come from him and him alone anyway. Keep your finger here. Turn to the right of your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. First Corinthians chapter one, verse 26. Where again, the Apostle Paul, writing to the Corinthians, was telling them how they were to do the work of ministry. They were to get busy about God's work, and don't think that you need to be qualified and need to be a super saint in order to do the work of God. He says in verse 26, "For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh. Not many mighty, not many noble are called. If you look at the church, it's not like the upper echelon of society. It's us common folks, us Joe Schmoes, you know. Some of you might be upper end, and God bless you. That's wonderful. But the, the vast majority of the body of Christ, not the upper end, six or seven digit figures a year crowd, But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of this world to put to shame the things which are mighty. See, God, in his economy, he uses the underdog. He uses the one, the the least likely, so that people will know that it's him and not the people. The things which are not, to bring to nothing the things are, that no, verse 29, that no flesh should glory in his presence. And so, well, Lord, I'm not a gifted speaker. It doesn't matter. You're perfect then because I'm not looking for perfect. I'm looking for available. Just looking for available. Who will go? Who will speak for me? Well, I can't because, no, 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 no. I didn't didn't ask who thinks they're qualified. I'm just asking who's available. Who wants to? Well, finally, in verse 13, Moses says, He doesn't have any more excuses, so he just comes out and says what's really in his heart. He said, oh, my Lord, please, send by the hand of whomever else you may send. Find someone else I don't want to. Well, at this point, Moses is just being downright stubborn, rebellious, insubordinate, and now God's mad. You know, God, I believe, puts up with a person for a while, until finally all of their excuses are gone and then they reveal their hearts that they just really don't want to serve God. That's when God gets mad. Notice, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses as he said, fine, is not Aaron the Levite your brother? I know that he can speak well. And look, he is also coming out to meet you. When he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. So apparently God wasn't too glad. (laughs) Yeah, Aaron will be glad, but I'm sure not glad right now. And I will be with your mouth and with his mouth. Or no, verse 15. Now you shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth. I will be with your mouth and with his mouth, and I will teach you what you shall do. For he shall be your spokesman to the people. He himself shall be as a mouth for you, and you shall be to him as God. So I will speak to you. You then will tell Aaron, and Aaron will speak for me through you to the people. And you shall take this rod in your hand with which you shall do these signs. So now God is, again, he's upset with Moses, but he makes this concession. And it wasn't God's perfect will. It was originally God's perfect will to simply use Moses. That was God's perfect will, God's plan A. Moses didn't want God's plan A. He forfeited it. So then God went with plan B to use Aaron. And though Aaron was a help, he also brought with him some baggage. Who was it that took all the gold jewelry and melted it down and made a golden calf and said, this is the God who brought you out of Egypt. Who was it that did that? Aaron, Moses' brother. Uh, Who was the one who with his sister Miriam led a, a mini rebellion against Moses and then the sister Miriam was, was struck with leprosy for a time. Who was the, that brother? Aaron. Not that Aaron, a different Aaron, of course. 
But here's the point. We can forfeit God's perfect will for God's permissive will, but there will always be trouble and baggage that comes along with plan B or C or D or double Z. There will always be problems there. So the goal is find God's plan A, where there is no baggage. Verses 18 through 26, get your house in order first. And this is, I believe, a heavy call to the husbands and fathers that are here tonight. Here we go. So Moses went and returned to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, how, about, well, how old is Moses at this time? He's 80. And now he's asking permission? You think by 80 years old you can make up your own mind? But here we're seeing the, uh, the, the paternal culture, just how the oldest relative, oldest living male, was in charge of making all the decisions for the rest of the family. Moses went and returned to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, Please let me go and return to my brethren who are in Egypt and see whether they are still alive. And Jethro said to Moses, Golly! No, he said, Get it, Jethro? Uh, uh, no, he said, go in peace. Now, the Lord had said to Moses in Midian, now, God had already told Moses, go to Egypt. Go return to Egypt, for the men who sought your life were dead. And this is, of course, referring to Moses' adopting grandfather, Pharaoh Thutmose the first. And by the way, that, that image on the right is indeed his mummified remains. And the, the image on the left is, is a, a, a carved image of, of what he looked like when, before he died. So it said that history kind of teaches that, that Thutmose I was kind of a, an arrogant, snotty sort of a guy. And even his mummy kind of looks like that, just kind of that sort of a cocky attitude. Anyway, we'll move on. Moses then took his wife, her name's Zipporah, and his sons. His sons' names at this point, well, his sons' names were Gershom and Eliezer. And he sent them on a donkey and returned to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the rod of God in his hand. And the Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you do all those wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put in your hand. But, and I love how, how God does not pull punches. He does not... Put, us, put on us rose-colored glasses and say everything's going to be beautiful. Come to Christ and your life is going to be perfect. Woohoo! Man, I tell you what, not only is this world hard, but when you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you also have to fight against the flesh. It's hard to be a Christian. It's a tough life. There are times of joy, no question about it, but there are hard things that Christians go through, but it's the only life whose retirement plan is out of this world. Woo That's right. And so, uh, when you go back, Moses took the rod of God in his hand. Uh, but I will, notice God says, but I will harden his, Pharaoh's heart, so that he will not let the people go. Hmm. Back in chapter 3, God said that Pharaoh wouldn't be willing. According to his own free will, he would not let you go. But here in chapter 4, we read that God was going to actually harden Pharaoh's heart. Well, what happened? What happened? Was Pharaoh a free moral agent able to harden his own heart? Or was his heart forcibly hardened by God against Pharaoh's will? What was the case? Later. That's okay. No, not, not you later. I'm just saying, in answer to your question, not initially. You see, in chapters 7 and 8, we read about the plagues that come upon. We read, first of all, we read Moses goes to Pharaoh. You better let my people go. God says, let my people go or else, you know, I'm going to kill your son. You know, Israel's my son. God, I love my son, Israel. You let him go or I'll kill your son. Initially, in chapter 7 and 8, Pharaoh hardens his own heart. And Pharaoh hardened his heart and would not let them go. But then in chapter 9, we read, after that, God hardened Pharaoh's heart or literally strengthened the position of his heart. Here's what happened. 
Pharaoh, harden his heart, harden his heart, harden his heart. The Bible says he who, who is often reproved and yet hardens his neck will suddenly, shock to them, be destroyed, and that without remedy. So a person can hear the gospel over and over again. Jesus is Lord. Believe in him or you go to hell. Come on, get saved or you're going to go to hell. And finally, they harden their heart, they harden their heart, but then they come to a place. There's a line. They can't see it, but it's there. They cross the line, the point of no return. And at that point, God only knows when that is. He says, you know what? They're done. They've sealed their fate. Therefore, I will now strengthen their resolve to where they can never, will never, come back. And that's what happened to Pharaoh. He had his chance. But he made his choice. And God knew the moment that he crossed that line. And therefore God strengthened his resolve. God hardened the position of his heart. You know, people that get into that state not only are headed for destruction, but they also drag along with them, their loved ones, to destruction as well. Verse 22, Then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. It's a special place in God's heart, his people Israel. And you, Pharaoh, you've been treating my son like a slave for 400 years. So I say to you, verse 23, Let my son go that he may serve me. But if you refuse to let him go, indeed I will kill your son, your firstborn. So Pharaoh, choose wisely. If not, kiss your son goodbye. Came to pass on the way. And so, so, um, so now he, you know, Moses gets this word from God. Now he's going back. His wife and his sons are with him. They're riding back to Egypt. Verse 24, it came to pass on the way at the encampment that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. It's kind of a rough start to a ministry, right? And we don't have a lot of time, but, you know, I mentioned wrecking a couple of vehicles on our way out. There were four of us who were driving from California. There was a big moving van, and my Dodge Ram van was being towed behind it. And there were two pickup trucks, uh, I had a pickup truck that was being towed by another pickup truck. The first pickup truck was owned by a young guy who didn't just love his pickup truck. He worshipped his... He was a believer in Jesus, but man, he loved his pickup truck. He had named it. He called it his baby. He took care of it. He just... You remember? You know who I'm talking about? Yeah. I mean, he he worshipped this pickup truck. Well, the guy who owned that truck, he was with me in the moving van at one time. And many of you know Jeremiah Oss, who was our youth pastor at the time, moved to Wyoming uh, a while back. He and another guy were in the two pickup trucks. They were in the front pickup towing mine. With me so far? Something happened. The steering got loose, and, and they fishtailed, and both trucks turned over across the highway there late, late at night in a place called Buckeye, uh, New Mexico. And nothing is there but pickup trucks. And uh, so the other guy and I, we're on this, we had CBs at the time, didn't have cell phones, it's pre-cell phone, this is a long time ago. So we had CBs and now we're out of range and where are they? So we turn around and we see way off in the distance a whole bunch of non-moving headlights. We say, well, maybe they're stuck behind an accident. Get close there, they are the accident. Now I'm panicking. Because, oh, great, God, you brought us out here so that I could kill Jay and the other guy. Oh, Lord. And so I'm yelling their names, and I'm running across the highway, and where are you guys? And I'm thinking, this is not the way to start ministry. And all of a sudden, I see Jay, and he says, we're okay. Well, the guy that I was with saw his truck, and he fell to his knees, and he cried, No! And I learned a valuable lesson. Here's the lesson. Never hitch your possessions to somebody else's idol. Because when God takes out their idol, whatever is attached to it is going with it as well. True story. 
And so Moses is coming back, and instead of God trashing their donkeys, God says, I'm going to kill Moses. Why is he going to kill Moses? Zipporah, and, and apparently Moses is now, he's sick. He's ready to die. And his wife knew why. Zipporah took a sharp stone, cut off the foreskin of her son, and cast it at Moses' feet and said, Surely you are a husband of blood to me. And so he, God, let him, Moses, go. I said, Moses recovered. And then she said, You are a husband of blood because of the circumcision. Evidently, Moses had failed to circumcise one of his two sons, and this was willful disobedience because way back with Abraham, God had said, You are to circumcise every male on the eighth day of his life. Zipporah apparently did not want to do that. Done with the first one. But now Eliezer probably is like, you know, that was so traumatic and mama can't handle seeing her little baby suffer like that. You're not going to do that. Wait till he's older. And in her mind, you know, the Midianite men, they were circumcised as adults. I tell you what, I'd rather have it done at eight days old when I will forget, you know. And so, I shouldn't have said that. Here we go, moving on. So, the man is looking at me. (laughs) What did you say? I'm I'm speaking, amen, man? Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. So calm down there, honey. So anyway, the adults practiced that for the, uh, the Midianites practiced that for the adults. And so Zipporah was against having it done to her baby. And Moses, who knew better, conceded, gave in, did not want to fight her. You know, he probably had the attitude, well, when mama's not happy, ain't nobody happy. And this is not a battle I'm worth, I'm, I'm ready to fight. Guys, when it comes to obeying the Lord, we've got to be willing to fight. We have got to be the spiritual leaders of our houses and tell our wives and our children, no, this is how it is. And if you have children, be prepared to fight many battles. What types of movies and music you'll allow into the house, the things, the, you know, it's, that's just how it is. And your kids may get upset But what you need to do at that point is take all the bills and say, fine, you pay them. We've got to fight and win. Otherwise, we put ourselves at risk as Moses did. We put ourselves at risk as Moses did. It's interesting. Zipporah knew that Moses' near-death experience was a direct result of them refusing to circumcise the baby. And so she did it anyway. She even threw that thing at Moses. Weird. It's interesting when the Holy Spirit through Paul was listing the qualification for elders ruling over uh, the church. One of the qualifications high on the list is make sure you rule over your own house. One who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? I want to serve the Lord. That's great. Begin by getting your family in order. Make sure that you men are the spiritual leaders. Women, make sure you're following. You know, some ladies are in a situation where, you know, their husbands aren't willing to lead, and I feel bad for you. I I, I hurt for you. But don't nag. Instead, somehow, some way, encourage your husband. Hey, there's a free breakfast Saturday, honey. Why don't you go? You know, the man up day's coming. I'd love for you to go to that. You know, encourage your husband. To man up and lead. Verses 27 through 31, we'll get through this quickly, I promise. Leaders of Israel, they respond. Lord said to Aaron, now go into the wilderness to meet Moses. So he went and met him on the mountain of God and kissed him. We don't know how long they had been apart, maybe 40 years. Now they're reunited. And so Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord who had sent him and the signs which he had commanded him. Moses and Aaron went and gathered uh, all the elders of, of the children of Israel. Aaron spoke all the words which the Lord had spoken to Moses. Then he did the signs in the sight of the people. It's a stick. It's a snake. It's a stick. It's a snake. Leprosy. Not leprosy. Blood water. You know. And then he did the signs in the sight of the people. So the people believed. 
God is real. Moses is the deliverer. Man, faith welled up within him. And when they heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel, that he had looked on their affliction, they bowed their heads and worshiped. At this point, they knew beyond all doubt that God cared. 400 years, they wondered, where is God? But now, finally, wow, God, you care. And soon you're going to deliver us from our bondage. You know, when we grasp those two concepts, number one, that God cares, and number two, that he's here to deliver us from all of our bondages, we also respond by bowing our heads and worshiping. What do you you say? Wow, God, you're so good. You care, and you're here to deliver me. Thank you, Lord. Now, Israel, they had their doubts, but may we not. May we never doubt that God cares and that he's always here to deliver us, and may we worship him for it. And Father, with that, we do worship you, and we thank you for how much you love us and how much you care for us. And Lord, all that you've done for us to save us from our sins, Lord, it's obvious you care. How much do you love us? You stretched out your arm and said, I love you this much. And then in that position, you allowed your creation, you allowed us to nail you to the cross. Lord, thank you. We worship you. We bless you. We glorify the name of Jesus. Lord, help us not to doubt you, to doubt your care and concern. Help us not to to fear the what ifs and to put a bunch of lame excuses before you as to why we don't think you can use us and why you should use somebody else. Lord, I pray that you would give us all a willingness. Lord, I pray that we would all just say right now, Lord, whatever you want, I'm, I'm in. Let's do it. And Lord, whatever lack we have, we trust you are more than able to make up for it. Lord, fill us with your spirit. Give us the gifts of the spirit. Help them to flow among us so that others will know that you are real. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen.